Damon says humans are oriented towards social interactions. You say Damon Tunguni G. <laughs> but it's very, very important. Everything, everything we have, everything we have in regards to our culture and our civilization, language and knowledge is because of social interaction. Everything we have. You can see Damon has very bad grammar. Imitation and mimicry are, I should have are there, I should just take out the imitation is innate. Imitation and mimicry are innate and connect us emotionally to others. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, I don't know meaning of the mimicry. Um, mimicry, imitation, basically the same. Okay? We imitate, imitate is to kind of copy an action or behavior. Mimic is particularly to copy an action. Innate. Everyone understand innate? Wow, most Americans don't understand innate. Really? Well, you guys also go to school to become teachers, so you probably should understand innate. Innate, no, you have a question? What, what's your question? Oh, let me tell you what innate means. Innate means that it is, you are born with it, okay? It is like a um, instinct, okay? You're, it's not something that you learn, something inside of you. Okay? Imitation and mimicry is innate. It's part of inside of us. You cannot not imitate. It's impossible. It's part of what it is to be human. And it connects us emotionally to others. I'll try to show you how. Neural mirroring. You don't understand neural mirroring. I will talk about that today. Do you understand the word neural? No. Neural? Neural is the adjective for neuron. Neuron. Brain? Neuron is how you break it. Neuronal cells. So neuronal or ne neural is the adjective. Neural mirroring makes understanding other minds possible. Makes basically makes empathy or intersubjectivity possible. In empathy, intersubjectivity, basically same. Okay? Empathy is the common word. Intersubjectivity is the specific technical word we use in psychology, wow. developmental psychology, cognitive science. Linguistics. <laughs> empathy, intersubjectivity allows us to understand the emotions and intentions of others. I will try to help you understand. Intersubjectivity helps us, allows us to understand the emotions and intentions of others. It's important that we understand the emotions and intentions of others. And well, there will be much more for you to write. I wouldn't go back there. Coordination of attentional and intentional behavior is the basis of culture and allows symbols to gain meaning. Attentional. Attentional. Where do I want your attention right now? Attentional. Where do I want your attention? You. On the word. Attentional. <laughs> How do you know I want your attention here? Eyes. I am pointing. And also I'm using my eyes as well. Excellent. I am pointing, I'm using my eyes as well, I'm bringing your attention here. Intentional, why? Why did I do that? Because it's important, I want you to look here. Why did I drink coffee? Thirsty. Maybe I'm thirsty, maybe I need more energy. Intentional, why do you do something? Okay, for example, I'm a baby. I'm a baby. <laughs> okay, so, well, I want a hug. That is my intention. My goal is to get a hug. How did I communicate that? Gesture. Through a gesture. And my gesture brings attention to me and brings attention to my needs, to my intentions. Okay? Coordination of attentional and intentional behavior. 
is the basis of culture and allows symbols to gain meaning. Again, this is just a gesture. Just a gesture. It's just a symbol. For what? A hug. It's just a symbol. Same as this is just a symbol. Do you understand? Yeah. Great. This is just a symbol. That is just a symbol. You can add other symbols to it. And it begins to take on meaning over time. If you're not smiling right now, maybe don't be an elementary school teacher. Oh. Because this is actually very fundamental to what it is to be human, and this is very much connected to what it means to help children learn, is that when they smile at you, you smile back. We are sharing in an emotional bond, in an emotional connection. This is fundamental to language, to knowledge, to culture, to our entire civilization. I'll try to show you how. <clears throat> what we're looking at here is we are trying to understand how, when I write this word right here, you understand? Yes. How? How can you understand that just, if I just put some lines, right? I just put some lines. Maybe I'll put a curve as well. I just put some lines somewhere and somehow just these lines end up having meaning to the point that you say, oh yeah, I understand. And it, look, these lines right here are not even the same as these lines right here. You understand this? Yes. You understand this? Yes. <laughs> how can you understand this? This is amazing. Particularly, how do you how do you really understand this word, which is also connected with the phonetic sound, happy. Okay, happy. We have the sound, which is also a symbol, phonetic symbol. How can you really understand that? Learning. Learning? Okay, in regards to the connection, the connections of the symbol, the symbol to something is learning process, certainly. The symbols for the, for the symbols to have meaning is a learning process, yes. How can you understand these symbols? Experience, feelings, you have been happy. You cannot understand the word happy. You cannot understand the word happy if you have never been happy. My friend, I'm talking to my friend, and I say to my friend, Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> my friend says, Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't know Yu-Gi-Oh. What is Yu-Gi-Oh? And I say, Oh, Yu-Gi-Oh equals. Confucianism. My friend says, oh, Confucianism. I understand. Does my friend understand Yu-Gi-Oh? No. Yeah. He understands maybe one sentence, right, in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. Confucianism is an ancient, uh, da -da -da, I don't know, like a moral system originating from South Korea, or originating from Korea. One sentence. Can you explain Yu-Gi-Oh with one sentence? No. Oh. Maybe he reads two paragraphs in the encyclopedia. Does my friend understand Yu-Gi-Oh? Yu-Gi-Oh equals Confucianism. Does my friend understand? No. A very shallow understanding, not deep. I understand Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> Who understands Yu-Gi-Oh better, you or me? Me. Why? You have. You have learned this for a long time. You're you have experienced Yu-Gi-Oh for a very long period. You have 
your entire life has been spent within a culture that is very much uh, um, influenced by Yu-Gi-Oh. So again, let's think about how symbols, just symbols, just sound, symbolic sound or symbolic visual symbol, how this has meaning, how we're able to learn. And again, the learning process is just this connection of these symbols becoming associated with emotions, with feelings, with experiences. This is related to the basics of acquisition. Language is highly complex, amazingly complex, and diverse. In Africa, some languages, they speak like this. <laughs> and they go, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I understand. All right, very complex, very diverse, right? We might have symbols like this, we might have symbols like this. I don't know, I don't know Chinese or Cyrillic or things like this, okay? And that this has meaning for people. Very complex, very diverse, and it changes over time. If I say charonam, you understand? Yes. Charonam. We look in Korean dictionary 100 years ago, not in the Korean dictionary. Changes over time also. So something very difficult, very complex, very diverse, changes over time. Wow, so difficult. And yet all children, all humans, unless they have some kind of neurological disorder or something like that, are able to acquire language from a very young age yet throughout the entire world. This is amazing. How does it happen? Again, foundations. I think that the foundations originate in social interaction. We find social interaction occurring at a very, very young age. This is uh, imagery taken from work by Professor Meltzoff at the University of Washington. They have a developmental psychology research center or something like that. And they're showing this is a very young infant. I don't remember how old, maybe two weeks old, maybe 10 weeks old, I don't remember exactly. Two to 10 weeks old, very young age. From a very young age, the infant begins to copy and imitate the behavior of the adult. The father goes, ah, da, 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 and the baby goes, ah, da, da, da. The father goes, this is amazing. This is not easy. This is not easy because you have, think about what is happening here. Is that uh, he or she, the mother, is making a facial expression and that that child is able to unconsciously, unconsciously understand that that facial expression, I can recreate that facial expression. How do I recreate that facial? Sticking out tongue, this is from a baby that can't move its hand, okay, with, with intention, all right? So this is an amazing thing that we are able to begin at a very young age to copy and imitate the behaviors of adults. It blows my mind. It shows that we have this very natural inclination, we're naturally inclined towards social interaction. Imitation and mimicry, this imitation mimicry that is innate, that is inside of us, promotes social interaction. It promotes, so when the dad, if the daddy goes, ah, ba ba ba, and the baby goes, father is not interested. Baby, I do this All right? But instead, you have the baby here, and he's like, ah, ba ba ba, and the baby goes, ah, ba ba ba, and he's like, promotes social interaction. It increases connectedness and emotional connectedness, and it enhances empathy. And we're going to see why that empathy is so important for our entire system of knowledge, system of language, our entire society, civilization. Some research. Humans prefer, or infants prefer, human stimuli. So you have a little baby, an infant, newborn baby, and you put this on the table, and you put Damon's face on the table, which one does she look at more often? It's people's yes. face. They prefer human stimuli. Infants and children are socially attractive, especially ladies. Ladies, 
What do you say when you see a little baby? Oh, Oh, Gyoa. And my little son, he says, oh, shit. He doesn't, no, he just doesn't like it when all the girls always say he's cute. He says, I am not cute, I am handsome. <laughs> so, infants and children are socially attracted. This is very, very, very important. Why is this important? That you say, oh, Gyoa. Because you are attracted to the infant. And when you are attracted to something, you are more motivated to interact socially. And that in social interaction, the species or group that has more social interaction is going to succeed more compared to other groups. And are socially responsive to adults. We say, oh, so cute, he's copying my behavior. Again, think about the father, I said, right, blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> Infants and toddlers seek out mutual attention through pointing and showing, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, also, back here to the socially responsive to adults, not just adults, also older children. Anyone have younger sister or younger brother? Yeah. Raise your hand. Okay, when you're in elementary school, your younger sister, younger brother always follow you? Sometimes you're like, ah, leave me alone, stop. <laughs> Don't bother me. Yeah, ah, I want to play with my friends, my friends, not your friends. Yeah? These children, they have a natural inclination towards older children. And that's good, and it's important, because it, it accelerates the learning process. What do we do in school? We separate kids. Oh, one age, one age, one age, one age, one age. Bad idea. We should actually have an integrated system where we have older kids and younger kids together. We'll actually increase the learning, the rate of learning, I think. Uh, okay, so infants and toddlers seek out mutual attention through pointing and showing, right? They say things like, um, you know, mm, so, so, right? There's a cow. Mm, mm. Ori, ori, okay? Parents also do this as well. And parents say, oh yeah, ori. Okay, we bring our attention, we share, we seek out mutual attention, again, we have mutual social interaction. Um, I'm gonna, oh, well this last part's actually interesting. We always think, especially as teachers, we always think that it is the teacher or adult and that the, the child copies and imitates us. Not true. True, but also we copy and imitate the child and we change our behaviors to more closely match the behaviors of the children as well. Okay? Because usually I don't talk like this. <laughs> oh, do you want some water? <laughs> I don't talk like that. But when I talk to a baby, I talk like that. Why? I don't know. It has to do is that it is not just one direction, it's two directions. And there's actually research by Nadal uh, to prove that uh, between the interactions between children. Uh, so again, remember that when you're a teacher. <sighs> now, how is this possible? This social interaction, the babies are imitating us, we're imitating them. What allows this? What facilitates this? It's called mirror neurons. And just, uh, yeah, yeah, again, you guys probably want to be taking lots of notes. Be my, my advice. Now. This is very recent research. This is within the last five years. Um, that's reading of the work of uh, Mark Iacomoni. He's out of a professor, research professor at the University of Southern California at their um, Cognitive Science Research Institute, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember who it is exactly. And what they do, uh, this, partic this particular discovery of the mirror neurons, I think, came from originally Parma, Italy at this um, primate monkey research institute. What they do is they have the monkey sitting there in a chair. They tie down one arm, and they have the monkey reach and pick up a peanut and eat the peanut, okay? Reach, pick up peanut, eat the peanut, okay? So the monkey is seeing the peanut. This is our visual cortex right here. The monkey is reaching 
the action of reaching, that is part of our, what's called our primary motor cortex and our premotor cortex. Motor, M-O-T-O-R, think about motor in a car or an engine. It's what makes us move. When I move, this is all motor cortex, okay? My motor cortex going crazy, yours, mm. all right, a little bit, we'll see how. Okay, so this is called executed reaching, I'm reaching. Pick up, paint it, put paint in my mouth, paint it, okay, but we're just specifically at the period of the reaching. Okay, you will see that here we have our visual cortex is active, we are looking at the peanut. We have our motor cortex, premotor cortex active. Here, this is our somewhat sensory cortex, which is feelings and the coordination of seeing and reaching, seeing and reaching. <coughs> Not important for today, okay? Not important. So we're looking here and here. Okay, then what we do is we take the monkey and we put down both of the arms. We strap down both the arms, can't move. Take a strap, put it across the head of the monkey. Monkey can't move head, just like this. Okay? No, don't cool. Don't cool. There you go, thank you. Okay. Now, we have somebody else, another monkey or another person, in front of the monkey, reach and eat a peanut. Notice right here, we get activity in the motor cortex. The monkey is not moving at all. But when she, <laughs> when she reaches and eats a peanut, it's part of the area of my motor cortex, when I observe it, when I watch, her reaching is active. Of course, I'm seeing it. And we also get this activity now. What's happening? Think about what's happening. Connected back to when I said smile. What's happening? Come on, you guys. Last class, got it. Let's go. Quickly, easy, simple. What? You need some? Okay. Imagine we recreate. We copy other people's actions inside of our brain all the time, subconsciously. When you were with a friend, maybe your friend is like, standing like this, you will naturally kind of stand a little straighter. If your friend smiles in your brain, you recreate the smile inside your brain as well. If your friend reaches, you actually reach inside your brain. You recreate it through your body. You recreate the actions of others. And you'll see why this is very, very important. Okay, You, you will see why this is very important. These are called mirror neurons. Okay, mirror neurons. That when somebody does an action, we recreate the action inside of our body. Again, when I smile, why do you smile? Because you're actually recreating the smile inside of your mind, and smiles happen to be something that we don't we don't repress easily. Yawning is another one. Other people are like, maybe some of you right now, okay? Can you think of some examples of a mirrored response? I want you together to think of some examples. So intersubjectivity, again, this is just the word we use in psychology or in the cognitive sciences. In psychology, intersubjectivity refers to the sharing of a subjective emotional or psychological state. We, we share an emotional or subjective, an emotional or subjective psychological state. Or a subjective emotional or psychological state. And again, how does this happen? How are we able to share emotions? Because we are not connected with wires. <laughs> We're 
we're not connected. So how is it that we are able to share an emotional psychological state? Let's think about this. Again, relates to mirror neurons. Right now, am I uh, sad or happy? How do you know? Expression. Okay, keep going. My facial expression, what do you do? How do you know what's inside me? You don't know my feelings. I see your face. Okay, and? I understand your expression. You recreate this, this, the face. You recreate the facial expression inside your brain. And that when your facial expression is the same, your feeling is sad. Your, your neurons and emotions. Empathy, or intersubjectivity, depends upon interaction between mirror neurons and the limbic system, which is a system related to emotional and hormonal response. The limbic system is right here in the middle, <coughs> where the midbrain and the, and the cerebrum meet, the, the neocortex, sorry, midbrain and the neocortex meet in the middle, not on the outside, but actually in the middle. This is where we have our pituitary gland. Does every, anyone know the pituitary gland? Pituitary gland is at the base, at the bottom of our brain, of our neocortex. And again, our brain has these chemical, electrochemical signals, synapses. Okay? But these electrochemical synapses also get trans communicated to the pituitary gland, which releases hormones into our blood. So for example, if I go like this to another person, that person very quickly, immediately, that person is seeing me go like this. That person's brain then communicates to the pituitary gland, releases adrenaline into the bloodstream very quickly. We get a buildup of sugars within our muscles and we get fight or flight, <laughs> flight or running is a normal, the two normal responses, the two most common, most common responses that we get to that situation. So notice that again, our, what, what happens is that we, our limbic system, our emotional system, our hormones are connected to our brain and then this also affects our behavior. So when I smile, you smile inside your brain, it connects to the limbic system, the mirror neurons are connected with the limbic system, which is connected to the good endorphins, endorphin, the good endorphins that are flowing through our system. So when I smile, you recreate the smile, you get good endorphins in your system, and you say, oh, Damon is happy, because now you can understand my feeling through your own body. We are not connected by wire. These mirror neurons are kind of like, these are kind of important things. Okay, it's a very, ability to share an emotional state. The ability to share an emotional, psychological state. Foundation for knowledge, language. This is empathy. Intersubjectivity, empathy. Latin for in. Feeling or emotion empathy is the ability to recognize and share emotions that are experienced by another person. Recognize and share emotions. And I I know you're like, oh David, oh David. I want you to have an emotional response. When you see this child who is eating pieces, crumbs of bread off of a dirty floor. I want you to have an emotional response when you see children who are crying over the loss of a loved one. Because this is human. If you do not have an emotional response, again, don't be an elementary school teacher. Okay, because you're not going to be a good elementary school teacher if you don't have an emotional response to this. And again, this is a very simple emotional response, right? I smile, you smile. I'm sad. Created inside your head, you get the emotional. This is a bond. Okay? And from a very, a very simple, a very simple bond, you can get amazing things.
from a very simple singular bond, you can get amazing things. I'm going to use a metaphor or analogy. Do you guys understand metaphor, analogy? Yes. Okay, I'm going to use a metaphor or analogy here of DNA. And DNA is just a simple bonding of basically we have four different compounds, endosine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think, I don't remember, I think it's guanine, cytosine, and endosine, and thymine bond together. The only two ways they bond, only two ways, zero and one. It's a binary system, kind of like computers, but not computers, okay? But anyways, we have a binary system, and with your DNA bonding together in two ways, in different patterns, bless you, in different orders, we get our genetic code. From our genetic code, we get Damon. <laughs> or we get other amazing things like you, or like penguins, or like Sangchu. All right? We get amazing things from these simple bonds. Sangchu, penguins, Damon. It's just bonding of these four elements in two ways. Four elements in two ways. And we, have, we get amazing things. I think the same for our society, our knowledge, language, our entire culture is connected to a simple bond between us being able to share emotional states. Our ability to share that simple bond of being able to share emotional states very basic, what I mean. Uh, and again, uh, I'm going to skip that part. I can even extend in animals, I'm going to skip that part. It's pretty amazing, though. I'm going to use a simple example. Okay? Baboons. Baboons are like the worst primate society. Okay? Baboons are, what's, what's it? Male, male baboon, big male baboons are big jerks. What's a jerk? Like a nothing set on, I don't know, like a jerk. Like just mean guy. Not baboon society. Horrible society, okay? Very strong social hierarchy. You have like one, two, three big male baboons. They get all the ladies. The other smaller baboons, no ladies, okay? And these guys are mean. They wake up in the morning, they go punch somebody, okay? Why? Because I'm big, all right? It's a really horrible society. Big males, like, 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 many, like most human males, they're not very nice, right? Not good people, joking. All right, anyways, so, Big white male wakes up, beats up a small young male. Okay? What happens next is that the females will go to the young male and groom the young male. This is not about reproduction. This is not about relationship in regards to like campus couple. Okay? <laughs> not a campus couple. Why? Why do the females go and groom the young male who is hurt? Why? Sympathy. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Empathy, sympathy, is that they know, hmm, when that big guy, when he hits me, it hurts me. I feel bad. I like it when someone hugs me, when someone grooms me. So I am going, I feel bad right now I because I see what had happened. I recreate it in my mind. So I go and I groom him, helps him feel better, helps me feel better. Okay, again, remember this very simple bond. And why is this important? Because, I mean, again, remember, these, these young males, they're not going to... They're not going to be important people in the society, but at the same time, is that it still makes them feel part of the group. And when we feel like we're part of the group, or we're part of the team, we're more likely to work together and interact socially. And cheetahs eat baboons. 
If you have a cheetah and a baboon, always bet on the cheetah. Cheetah's going to win. <laughs> but if you have a cheetah and many baboons that are socially connected together, they can beat the cheetah and help the group survive and help the group grow. Okay? So again, let's think about how we have these very simple emotional bonds allows us to grow and achieve great, amazing, wonderful things. So, why is intersubjectivity so important? Okay, if you need to use the back of your paper, you can use the back of your paper. Intersubjectivity has multiple effects. It inclines us toward imitative behaviors. Okay? Father, the baby, ha, ba, ba, ba. Okay, we get imitative behaviors. It facilitates mutual attention. I want your attention? Smile. Here on the smile. How do you know? How do you know where I want your attention? Drawing My gesture. You recreate it inside your head. You're like, oh, Damon is pointing here. If I was pointing here, my attention is here. So you are recreating through the mirror neurons in your brain my action, which then allows us to then triangle, bring, coordinate it to a, to a, uh, to now something else, anything else, okay? In this case, it's a symbol, and maybe I might do this. So then I smile, like, ah, smile, and you're like, oh, attention, oh, smile, oh, give it each one, oh. Now we've got, do you understand this symbol? Yeah, just a line, just a dot, just a dot, jump, jump. Facilitates mutual attention through gesture and allows for the physical coordination of meaning. This is nothing. This is nothing. It's just an abstract symbol. Okay, so the symbol, or especially if we just say a symbol like this. I mean, this doesn't even look like an eye. This doesn't look like a mouth. Does this look like, if I draw it like this, does that look like mouth? No, it doesn't even look like a mouth, really. Okay, I mean, does... What is this? What am I drawing? Frog. frog. This does not look like a frog, but you're right. I was drawing a frog. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm drawing a frog. <laughs> does not look like a frog. Frog is like this big, okay? It allows us to be able to coordinate <laughs> random si symbols that then begin to have meaning for us. They might say, whoa, and you're like, oh, frog. Okay, even though it's not really a frog. And this is because we like to look where other people are looking. We like to copy their actions. We like to we recreate with those actions. Imitation of mutual attention along with gesture Allow for the coordination of meaningful symbols. Happy. Mm -hmm. Confident. Which person is confident? Right. Can I have the right? Hey, I put more on the guy on the left. You see, he just is like, go. <laughs> and again, you recreate it inside your head. You're like, oh, he's confident. Because he's a good fighter. Okay, door. Have you guys ever seen him fight? Really good. Door, screen. What is this? It's a screen. I'm bringing your attention. How do you know? Okay, simple. Simple foundational connection between us. Through these mirror neurons, through our emotions, through our experiences, we are able to build all knowledge, all understanding of the world, of our culture, of our civilization, through our social interaction, our shared experience. Okay? We are big.
basically finished. This is what's known as the sociocognitive theory. The foundations of learning are social, always. The foundations of learning, of all learning is social. You cannot really learn without being within a social system. A shared social, a shared experience. Language learning is always mutually shared. You cannot learn a language without other people. Impossible. Not possible. Because language is just symbols that are socially agreed upon, socially shared. Meaning in language can only, oh, more bad grammar, can only come from shared experience. Do you understand Yu-Gi-Oh? Learning is an emotionally involved process. You cannot separate. People like to think. They think, oh, learning is objective. Learning does not involve emotions. Not true. Impossible. You cannot control your ability to turn off emotions. Right now you have emotions. You cannot say, oh, I'm not going to be emotional today. Impossible. Your pituitary gland all the time is putting hormones into your bloodstream. And the hormones that go into your bloodstream go back up into your brain. Learning, especially language learning, always extends beyond the individual. Learning is never just inside yourself. For us to be able to learn knowledge, we need other people. Because knowledge is just symbols. Socially agreed upon symbols, or ideas, or concepts, or schema, that we share together. You cannot learn without other people. It's impossible. Or, you cannot learn knowledge. You cannot learn knowledge. You cannot learn language without other people. Remember that when you become a teacher. Please. We are finished. When you finish, then you're.